Hi, this is Sally Morgan, physical therapist, craniosacral therapist, and Tellington T-Touch practitioner for animals and people. And this is Tristan. He's a corgi. And we are here today for another episode of Conversations with a Corgi, where we are going to continue to be talking about Reiki. And today I want to tell you more about what it's like to have a Reiki treatment or to give a Reiki treatment so that you have some understanding of what that might be like if you happen to want to bring your pet to a Reiki treatment or indeed if you'd like to become a Reiki practitioner for animals. We've already talked about Reiki being a system of healing um, developed by Yusui who then transferred that knowledge to a woman named Takata who was from Japan and then lived in Hawaii. So most of us have learned from her. And it is a system of gentle hands-on healing where you are channeling universal life force energy from the great beyond, whatever you see that as, through your body to um, the animal or person that you're healing. And so that information is not coming from you directly. And it's totally up to the animal or person you're working with whether or not they want to use that healing and how they use that healing. Someone may say that they have a headache but in fact, what their body needs is to heal some old injury in their ankle or something, and that is where the energy will go. So you are not really deciding to fix something. You are just being a neutral presence to bring healing energy to the person or animal you're working with. So Reiki, a Reiki session typically lasts about 45 minutes to an hour, and I like to have some quiet music playing for the person or animal I'm working with, and certainly that goes for animals as well as people. Um, if I'm in a barn, then of course I can't always do that. But um, if you have music, there's so much music made specifically to do Reiki treatments that it has about five minutes of a certain type of music that will gently shift into another type of music because you are working on the chakras. And so each time you make a shift, um, the music has a change in it so that you as a practitioner can be in a meditative state and just work your way through the body without having to look at the clock and keep yourself in your left brain. This is sort of a right brain practice when you're doing it where you are the whole time in a meditative state. So a lot of this music has really long sustained tones which are very calming and relaxing and they will um, change the brain waves in your brain to a pattern that is more in a, a theta state, um, a state of like sleep and relaxation, um, rather than you know figuring out numbers in your head and trying to do your taxes while you're laying on the healing table, or for your dog thinking about chasing the squirrel when in fact he might be ready for a nap. So I like to start with some quiet music made for Reiki because there's so many great ones available. Um, and then it's always a good idea to take uh, a few minutes to clear the room where you're doing the work. I have an office that I use particularly to do healing work. It has a lot of my books in it, so it's not exactly what someone would call clutter-free, but the knowledge in those books, I feel, comes through me when I'm working, and I think it's helpful. Um, you know, I don't read crime novels. I don't have books about people dying. I have books about healing and books about anatomy and books about shamanic work and things like that in that office. So those um, people who wrote the books and are in the books, I feel like are somewhat helpful. And then many people will often sage the room or use um, a purification essential oil spray or something like that to kind of clear the energy in the room before and after the treatment. I sometimes for an animal will put a, a drop or two of lavender on the carpet, um, not where they will be laying so that they have that relaxation from the lavender as well. And it does sort of create uh, an environment when you have a smell and animals are so sensitive to smell. Not all animals like lavender and I know some that don't. I always ask them first. <laughs> um, and then I use something like lemongrass sometimes they like, uh, Valor, which is a Young Living oil blend they seem to like. Um, there's also one called Peace and Calming that smells a little like wintergreen that some of them like. And many animals like frankincense, um, which I generally use for crossing the rainbow bridge in particular, but it's, it's some, a, a wonderful scent for healing because it does get you into your higher consciousness. And for a lot of rescued dogs, they're not able to do that yet because they are so stuck in their survival mode of trying to get through life to get to the point where you have rescued them. So frankincense is another popular one that they like. 
So I will clear the room uh, energetically with some chants or possibly with the sage or both. And that's before and after the treatment, have the music playing. And then I take a few minutes to center myself. And sometimes I might do a heart hug. And sometimes um, many Reiki practitioners will do some kind of a prayer or a ritual to set their intention um, before they start a session. Um, they may pray to God uh, or Jesus or you know any other deity that Buddha. Um, I often just say something brief like, may this session be for the highest and best of everyone in this room. So that's for the person, the animal, me, um, and anyone else that happens to come along like a second pet that might be waiting for his session. So something simple like that is fine and I don't say it out loud, I just think it. And then I usually make some sort of uh, contact with the pet physically with my hand here where I have my hand on Tristan right now actually in the area of the eighth chakra which is about their connection to humans to be able to make friends with the animal if I don't know him I will approach him with my hand this way so it's not threatening see how awful that is compared to this so I will just stroke him there a few times Generally, between the lavender and the music, the animal is pretty quiet. They may be laying on their owner's lap or their pet guardian's lap. Um, a lot of kitties like to be on their person's lap, and they'll kind of walk off their lap and lounge on the sofa all stretched out during the session. A lot of bunnies will stretch out as well. So um, that's how a session starts, and then I center myself, take a few deep breaths, and come into contact with the animal. Now, in some cases, um, with horses and with dogs, they are not able to be touched. They are in such a state, like a recently rescued pet, for instance, where I'm going to work off the body, in which case I skip that step of making contact with the eighth chakra. You like standing up here this week, don't you? He says, those are slippery shorts and it's hard for me to stay on your lap. So next thing I'll do, you're going to be working on the chakras, which you're going to start down at this end of the animal and work your way up with gentle hand placements all the way up to the crown chakra. So I will take a few deep breaths. Bisky, stay here because I have to hold both hands on your butt. So we start with the root chakra, which is the first chakra. And often if they're standing, they will sit down. And this is uh, for survival, fight, flight, fear. And this is an important area for the animal to uh, have open and functioning well and especially a rescued pet who's been overstressed in the shock or trying to survive. Uh, often they'll lay down while I'm working here. Often you'll heal, feel your hands heating up and the animal may also feel heat in that area of their body. This is an important thing. You may need a little fan on the floor for them because if they have a lot of stress in this area and they're a bigger dog, the amount of heat they release can be quite a lot and you need to keep them cool um, so that they're comfortable. By the same token, many animals release heat and then they're cold so you might need to have something to heat them up a little bit sometimes they just snuggle with their person so I would hold this area for five to ten minutes until I see um, the animal relaxing and feel the sense of releasing in this area they might be yawning like Tristan is blinking there are specific tissue release signs we teach in craniosacral therapy um, that are common in all therapies that you see the animal may release gas, you may hear rumbling in the stomach, and just general relaxation. And be aware, if you're a Reiki practitioner, you may see the same response in the person who lives with the animal while you're working on the animal. Um, I've seen this especially with cats. Cats and their people seem very connected, um, more than you would think. And of course with dogs and also with horse people, some of them will be on the third chakra and they just go, oh, I'm so tired and they sit down on a bench. So the treatment will extend to them as well. And then we work up to the second chakra, which is in the area of the sacrum, which is pretty far up on your dog. Let me see if I can get him up here. The sacrum on the dog is like right between the hips. So you don't have to find it exactly. Your hands are pretty big even on a large dog that they'll cover that area and again as you remember from our series on chakras this is an area associated with procreation so 
All the sexual organs are associated with this area. And many animals have uh, restrictions around this area from spay and neuter. As much as we need to do it, it can be a little bit hard for them. For Tristan, it was harder than I thought. And then we work our way up to the third chakra, which is the solar plexus. Now, if my dog flips over on his back or my cat and is laying upside down, you can do this on their tummy side as well. And as I mentioned before, our session would last an hour, but we're gonna abbreviate this so that it moves along a little more quickly here this morning. So the solar plexus is really about where your diaphragm is, where you take a deep breath under your rib cage, and then in the middle of your back, and as you recall, the third chakra is the area where love, will, and wisdom meet. And it's uh, a power center in your body. And so you need strength in your solar plexus to have uh, will to move ahead and to function well in the world. And because this is right below the heart chakra, this is where your, your will and your wisdom and your love combine so that you can do the best that you can in the world. And in an animal, for instance, who holds his breath a lot because he's fearful, oh, Tristan's using the table as a pillow, um, you may have a lot of releasing in this area. Horses, a lot of saddles interfere with this area, so it's really an important area to work with on a horse. Uh, a lot of cats bend in this area when they're jumping, so again, they may have some restrictions there. And then we work our way up to the heart chakra which is under the shoulders. I will often put my hand on their chest for this because the physical heart is under there. And just sort of refocus as you work your way up the animal's body and pay attention to how they're doing. And especially if you have an animal that's really sleepy or in a meditative state while you're working with them, you want to be really gentle and sometimes people will leave one hand on and move one hand to the next chakra as they work their way up the body so that it's not disruptive to what's happening in the animal's body and they don't have that sense of oh my gosh where did those hands go and then they creep back on somewhere and surprise them so often people will move up one hand after the next So the heart is the fourth chakra, and then we move up to the throat chakra. You're welcome, Bishki. So again, I usually keep one hand under and one hand above. For some animals, this may be too much. They may feel like they're being strangled. One hand above can often be quite sufficient, or two hands. Or if you have a little animal like a rabbit or a kitty, even some fingers could be enough. But Tristan, thankfully, has never been strangled or caught by his collar, so He's okay with my hands like this. And again, that throat chakra is for communication and speaking your truth. A lot of the senses are associated with that chakra. And you can review the meanings of all the chakras on our earlier episodes of Conversations with a Corgi on our talks about chakras. And after the throat, we have the third eye, which is between the dog's eyes. It's not as high up as Tristan's fairy kiss. It's down in this area. 
And so often I can have a hand on both sides of his head for this. And sometimes I don't. Biscuit. See how he's stretching his neck to release his throat? He's happy. And he has a little bit of cream cheese stuck to his nose from his last night clean up in a bowl. <laughs> we'll have to take care of that biscuit. And remember the third eye is for emotional and spiritual love, spiritual inner sight, intuition, illumination, those aha moments, insight. And then the eighth chakra, which is in fact where Tristan's fairy kiss is. See how surprised he was when I had no hands on him. The eighth chakra or seventh chakra is on the crown of the head and that's the crown chakra associated with the pineal gland. And remember this chakra is our connection to the divine, whatever that is. And you know, a lot of animals, especially horses with the bridles we put on them, they have injuries in their heads. And so having some healing energy in this area can be really a relief to them. And this connection with higher consciousness can be really important for a rescue dog. As you heard in the flower essence series, a lot of rescue dogs are stuck in their lower chakras and they're trying to take too much responsibility for things in their lives and they have not connected with their higher consciousness. So this can be a great thing for them. And it's not uncommon for an animal to do what Tristan is doing, to kind of move their head around, to put my hand where they would like it, and to help release some of that stuck energy they may be having. And one thing I didn't mention, I often will take a pendulum and go up the animal's body over the chakras prior to a treatment to just kind of assess how the chakras are moving and what the energy of the animal is like. And then I will use it again after a session just to check and make sure everything's clear and moving strongly. And just a little aside, I know myself, one of my chakras naturally spins counterclockwise. And thank God I have a really good shaman I work with who figured that out because she kept trying to correct it and then I'd have horrible headaches. So instead she uh, learned to enhance it and that made me better. And so a lot of animals too may have one chakra that spins counterclockwise. This is not cause for concern. Just be aware of it and don't try to change it because, unless the animal has, you know, like recently been hit by a car and it may be out of whack because of something like that. God forbid. So this is working on the crown chakra. And then, as you recall, animals have an eighth chakra that is about their connection. He's still working up here, so I'm not moving that hand. That is about their connection with us and their relationship with us. And that is down here in the area of the brachial plexus, which comes out of the spine towards the front legs. And some people even call that the brachial chakra. And some speak people also in Reiki speak of this eighth chakra, even in people as part of the connection to the divine and to one another. So the chakra is important. Are you done with that one? Good boy. So you can just make a butterfly of your hands over the area of the eighth chakra. You can use one hand or two and just allow that heat to come and any healing energy that needs to be transferred to that area to come through your hands. Very important to keep your feet on the ground when you're doing this work um, to stay grounded yourself. So you don't transfer your stuff into the dog. And if you feel stuff coming from the dog, it goes out of you and back into the earth because the earth can absorb all of that. And then of course, after I've done this, if I have more time in the session, you can use many of the same hand positions we use in craniosacral therapy um, around the skull or between the occiput and the sacrum to move energy in the spinal cord or up and down some of the legs. Uh, the nerves in the hind legs if you're working with a corgi or a dog with DM. Um, 
and any other particular areas. Uh, for instance, if your dog has some gut issues or your kitty, you might do some extra work in that area. And again, you just sandwich your hands over the area of disturbance. And they often talk about things like a bee sting and you just put your hands on either side of the area with the bee sting and send that Reiki energy and it will help relieve some of the pain and stinging of that area. And I always like to end with my hand back on the sacrum a little bit just to reground the animal before I let them walk out of my room. I like them to be able to feel their legs and I'll even do some tea touches maybe on their paws to help reconnect them to the earth. So that's a little bit about what a Reiki session would look like if you were working with your dog or your horse or your kitty or your bunny or taking your pet to someone else who's doing that work for them. So tomorrow for our Reiki series, we're going to talk about what some of the skeptics say about Reiki. And I'm going to refute that as best I can so that you can understand some of the benefits of Reiki and not be dissuaded by the naysayers. So um, what else do we have today, Biscuit? Uh, we have a few other announcements that are coming up, but again, I want to remind you of Dream Vision 7. My book is being advertised all month on their website, and again, my sister has uh, a radio show uh, twice weekly on Dream Vision 7, which you can get on the internet, and her shows are about dogs, health and wellness, pets in general, um, sometimes horses, and they are at 7 in the morning Eastern Time and 7 p.m. Eastern Time. The same show airs uh, all day Monday and the same next show will air on Tuesday. Eventually these will be archived and you'll be able to access them, but I have found that 7 in the morning time is great for me and a lot of other people who are getting ready in the morning and it's nice to be able to listen to something. She's been interviewing some really wonderful people from the animal world. Um, Ian Billinghurst who wrote the book Give Your Dog a Bone and Linda Tellington and uh, some of her, her colleagues who have been working to end some of the horrible things they're doing in the pet food industry. So it can be really beneficial um, to listen to these shows if you have an interest in the greater animal world. And you'll notice Tristan's getting a little sleepy. Often it's nice at the end of a Reiki session to let your animal have a little bit of a nap, not to rush them out. So I try to schedule some space between my clients if I'm doing a lot of Reiki and actually in no matter what I'm doing really, <laughs> so that uh, animals have time to integrate what we've done and I can explain things to the people and any kind of follow-up tea touches they need to learn. So this has been Sally and Tristan for another episode of Conversations with a Corgi. I think today I'm going to possibly go to the Big E, which is our big New England fair. Um, it's the first day today. It's kind of almost raining out but I'm pretty busy right now because I have my T-Touch class in New Jersey in two weeks. And next weekend, what are we doing next weekend, this? Oh, we'll be back at the Cape for a dog show. And that will be really fun. Uh, it's a fun dog show and uh, silly costumes and kids events with dogs and just a lot of happiness there to raise money for their shelter, which as I've mentioned before, mostly houses kitties because they've really found homes for every dog that's been lost there. Wearing your pretty bandana, huh, Bess? She says, I'm sparkly. Don't forget tomorrow is Saturday, so we will be doing our conversations with a corgi at around 9.25. <laughs> we are having trouble with the timing lately. I just have so many events going on at night that I'm just like not functioning well very early in the morning. So anyway, we will be back tomorrow and everybody have a great day. And we're going to end again with yet another heart hug because there can never be too many for the people and animals affected by the hurricanes. Thanks for joining us today. Everybody have a great day.